stop. Respect the boundary. Respect the lack of consent. This is another thing I see people do where they push, but it's now or never. My prices are going up. If you don't get it now, it's not available for sale for another year. If you don't get it, somebody else will. I have three people waiting. Ugh, that pressure that you put on people, you have to get it now. And I know where that comes from. You have to pay your bills because you quit your job too soon. <laughs> You have sales goals to hit and you're going to feel stupid if you don't hit them. You are putting pressure on yourself in some way and you are extending that pressure to your potential customers and clients. Do you want to know my number one tip for how entrepreneurs can handle objections? You don't. <laughs> I've got a snippet here for you to watch from a recent YouTube live that I did where I talked about how you shouldn't be handling objections. In fact, if you're getting a lot of objections, something is really wrong in your business. So I'm going to walk you through the three most common types of objections you're probably getting and tell you why you're probably getting them and what you can do about it. But first, hello, if we haven't met yet, my name is Lindsay Johnson, AKA the Radical Connector. I'm a consent based sales coach for new and scaling entrepreneurs who want to figure out how the heck to get themselves in front of the right people, the customers, the clients who are already looking for you with money in hand and co-create that sales journey together. While you're here, please subscribe to my channel, hit that bell so that you get alerted when I go live or post new videos. All right, let's get into it. All right. How do you handle objections? This is a long one. How do you handle objections? You don't. You don't handle objections. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you are getting lots of objections, something is wrong. You shouldn't be getting lots of objections. <laughs> Okay. And I know there are entire books and courses and people that go on stages and talk, get paid thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to tell you how to handle objections. If you're getting objections, something is wrong. <laughs> so let me tell you the three most common objections that people get. Okay. Number one, no money. I can't afford it. I don't have money. Listen, if people don't have money, they don't have money. Okay. Or if they do have money, this isn't what they want to spend their money on. Okay. People will say things like, oh, people will find the money if they really want it. Or if you really believed in yourself, you would find the money or, you know, put it on their credit cards. You'll, you'll make it back in X amount of months or weeks or days. Bullshit. Okay. If you're convincing people to put things on credit in order to afford what you're selling, man, you gotta, you gotta double check. You gotta check in with your priorities, with your, with your sense of morality and ethics, because that is messed up. Okay. We should never be pressuring people to put things on credit to buy from us. All right. <laughs> You're getting that tough love that, well, I'm well known for my tough love. All right. If people keep telling you they can't afford it, either you are talking to the wrong people right? You are charging the wrong price or you need to rethink your offerings and have maybe a free option, a low cost option, and then that higher cost option and thinking about who are the people that can afford that, right? We should not be encouraging people to go into debt to buy our stuff. That's messed up. All right. Yeah. Like I just keep thinking of people that, oh God, I mean, who, who hasn't done that? We've been suckered into doing it. We have been taught to do that. I just can't stand the thought of somebody not being able to like buy groceries or pay their car payment or, you know, pay their gas bill because they are trying to afford to work with me. I remember having somebody once do that. She had just quit her job and was wanting to work with me and was like asking for, you know, a guarantee, right? If I, if I work with you, how much, how soon until I make money back? When will I get money? I really need money. Nope. I, I literally was like, I think you should go get a job. I don't think we should work together. I think you should get a job and get yourself on stable financial footing first. I'm not going to work with that. I, first of all, I don't want that kind of pressure. And I've seen what happens to entrepreneurs or anybody who lives like that. It's not good. It, it I mean, I swear it takes years off your life. No, that's a level of stress nobody needs. Okay. Um, so yeah, like I said, if your program product or service is being sold to people who can't afford, have afford it, that is a you problem, not a handling objections problem. Something is wrong. I should say that's a business structure problem. You need to look at what you're offering and make sure that you're connecting to the right market, the right customer and clients, and that you're charging the right price. And you might want to look at having different tiered options. Okay. No time. I have no time. I want to, but I have no time. 
listen, you can't make time. I know you all say it. I've heard, I've heard you say it. People will be like, well, I just have to make time. Bitch, if you cannot make time, 24 hours, <laughs> 365, like time is what it is. Okay. I mean, we're not going to get into like quantum physics and stuff like that. Okay. But like <laughs> for everybody, for most people, you know, it's 24 hours in a day and no, not everyone has the same 24 hours in a day. Don't come at me with that BS. Okay. Somebody who has like, you know, a full-time nanny and a personal assistant and a food delivery service and a, and a someone that comes and cleans their house, you know, like that person does not have the same 24 hours that like a single parent who, who works two jobs or like, you know, a student who's going to school and also starting a side hustle and also, you know, has to be there for their family to take care of maybe an aging parent. I don't know. Okay. Listen, we don't all have the same 24 hours in the day. Um, some of us have, you know, <laughs> six hours outside of all the responsibilities to do things. Some people have two hours outside of all the other responsibilities to do things. Some people have three hours a week outside of all the responsibilities to do things. All right. And some people have 20 hours a week, right? Because we have more responsibilities than just our businesses. And we all have different levels of support, right? So <laughs> you catch my drift. If someone says to you, they don't have time and you keep hearing that over and over, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. You have to look at what you're selling. Why am I either asking people to do something that takes so much time or talking to people who need to invest time, but don't have the time again, you'll make time if it's important to you. No, you'll find the time. If it's no, no, if you're asking too much time or you're asking the wrong people to give up time, you have to figure out what is going wrong there. All right. Stop putting that on other people. Mwah. Okay. Not right now. I love this. Not right now. Stop. Respect the boundary. Respect the lack of consent. This is another thing I see people do where they push, but it's now or never. My prices are going up. If you don't get it now, it's not available for sale for another year. If you don't get it, somebody else will. I have three people waiting. Ugh, that pressure that you put on people, you have to get it now. And I know where that comes from. You have to pay your bills because you quit your job too soon. <laughs> You have sales goals to hit and you're going to feel stupid if you don't hit them. You are putting pressure on yourself in some way and you were extending that pressure to your potential customers and clients. Okay. No, if somebody has said not right now, you have to respect it. That is the heart of consent based selling, right? We respect people's yes, no's or not right now's. Okay. So if someone says not right now, that's great. Invite them to join your community, your Facebook group, follow you on social media, get onto your email list, follow you on YouTube, whatever that is. Invite them to connect with you in some way and in a way that you can stay connected and still continue to build relationship in whatever way that looks like. Right. And then if, and when the time is right for them, they'll come back and they'll be like, all right, let's do this. I my gosh, do I'll meet people and it'll be one year, two year, five years, seven years later, they'll come back to you. I remember I just had a conversation with someone. I met her at a pool party ages ago. And this is an outlier. I'm not saying this is a business strategy. This is an outlier. But like seven years ago, we met at a pool party. And then she's like, hey, I think I'm gonna start a business. Can we talk? Right? Because why? Because she's around because I'm active on social media because we follow each other, right? And it's not that I'm actively reaching out to this one person to make sure that I'm like poking at them. I'm just showing up and we're in each other's space because of social media, right? So when it was time for them, they reached out to say, hey, I remember you, I wanna talk to you, okay? So if it's a not right now, respect that, but make sure that there's a place that you're directing people where you're still staying active so that they can still stay aware and connected to you, okay? The other part of that, this is where we talk about, you know, remember I talked at the beginning of this live here where I talked about, you're not just a practitioner as an entrepreneur. You're also the person doing the business development and bringing people into your world to let them know that you exist, that you have a product program or service that exists that they might want. You need to be doing a lot of that and you need to be diversifying the things that you do, right? So in my world, I teach four fast and free revenue generating activities, right? There's networking, public speaking, community building, and content marketing, which includes social media, SEO, and email marketing. So you've got to be doing, you got to be diversifying your activities. So you're getting all sorts of people from all sorts of avenues. One of the reasons, I remember I talked about that applying pressure, 
And so we extend that pressure to our potential customers and clients. That happens because we don't have enough people coming into our world. And so we get a couple of people that show interest. We get really excited. We start counting our chickens before they've hatched, right? Oh, you know, here we go. This is it. You're already counting the sale just off of one conversation. And then if they don't decide to buy from us or work from us in that moment, we feel so much disappointment and sense of failure, but also like, whoops, I was already counting that money and now it's gone. The money was never there. But anyways, because we get in that space, we start to apply pressure. Remember, people will buy from you if and when it's right for them. Okay. So we have to keep our pipelines full of really cool new people, really aligned people coming in. So we're never applying that kind of pressure to any one person. And we're not applying that pressure to us. If you're getting lots of objections, something is off. So I'm going to tell you the five places that you need to look right now that might be causing you to get objections. Okay. So number one, as I said a lot already, your market is off. Your customer or client is off right? You are talking to the wrong people. You are trying to sell to the wrong people. So who is your customer? Really thinking about who is the person who is looking for me, right? Who is the person I want to work with or who I want to purchase my products, programs, or services? And I could use the the niche, the niche word here. <laughs> we could talk about niching or niching, depending on where you live. But people kind of get freaked out by that because they start going into this like, I need to know my niche. I don't know my niche. What is my niche? And they start telling me things like, I'll say, who is your customer? And they'll be like, oh, it's <laughs> it's a, a woman aged uh, 17 to 35 who makes this much money and you know lives here. And like, I don't care. I don't care. That is such an ineffective way to niche yourself. I want to know the problem you solve and who has that problem and who is actively looking right now for that problem to be solved. Okay. I don't care how old they are. I don't care what they order at Starbucks. I don't care how many dogs they have. I don't care. What is the problem they have that you solve and who are the people who are looking for that problem to be solved? That's what you need to know. Okay. Then the next thing, once you get clear on that is your offering, your offerings might be off, right? You might be offering, and this is so friggin' common offering something that you think people need or should want, but you haven't actually proven it's what they want, right? Or they might want it, but you haven't proven that they'll pay for it. Right. How many times have you scrolled past something or walked past something and said, oh, that's cool. I'd love that. But you never buy it because you're not actually going to buy it. Right. How many times have you filled your online cart full of things? What? Okay, I'm done. (laughs) Right. You're not trying to just sell what people need to the people who need it. You need to think about I'm selling what people want to the people who want it. Okay. So you need to do your market research. You need to make sure that it's what people actually want and what they need. When I first started my business, it was, oh gosh, 2013. And I was the networking boutique. And I started off selling networking coaching and trainings. And I was really excited to show entrepreneurs how to use networking to grow faster, right? To grow easier. And I had such a great website and I was doing like all these trainings and these workshops and these events and doing lots of networking myself, but I wasn't reaching entrepreneurs. The people who were hiring me, whether it was to come into their organization to talk or to work one-on-one with me, were people who worked in corporate spaces because they understood the power of networking, right? I was doing random things too, like helping people with their pitches, helping people with their public speaking, helping people with their social anxiety and confidence. I was doing, and then of course, networking workshops. I was doing a million things and I was getting paid well, but none of it was what I wanted to be doing, which is helping entrepreneurs grow faster and easier. (laughs) I didn't want to be in corporate spaces. I wanted to work with entrepreneurs. And so I had to pay attention. What were entrepreneurs asking me for? They were asking me for help with selling. They were asking me for help with marketing. They didn't understand how to get themselves in front of the right people with confidence and then make it easy for them to buy. They didn't understand how to do all this. So that's what I started doing. I ended up rebranding and became the radical connector. And I ended up teaching marketing and sales skills, specifically my brand of consent-based marketing and sales based on the work less play more system that I've created after years of being in the space and understanding how to get in front of the people who are looking for you (laughs) and make it easy to buy from them based on consent. 
Okay, so you need to make sure that what you're offering is what they want, all right? If people are not buying, but they like you, and they're following you, but they're not buying, I bet it is something about what you're offering. You're missing the mark on what people actually want. Next, if all those three are great and still people aren't buying from you, look at the price. Are you charging too much? Are you pricing yourself out of your market? Are you charging too little? Are people not taking you seriously? Let's talk about both of those. Number one, charging too much. Okay. <sighs> Lindsay, don't freak out. There is this thing. There's this thing that's taught in certain entrepreneurial circles. Charge what you're worth and then add tax. Okay. Your worth is invaluable. You as a human being are important. You are so valuable beyond any dollar amount. We love you. We need you. We want you. You belong here. The cost of your programs and products and services are not based on your worth and value as a person. They are based on the market value, what people will pay, what people expect to pay. You don't set that. Your market does, okay? Your industry does. So this baloney of charge what you're worth and then add tax, I see entrepreneurs outprice themselves or price themselves out of their market so quickly because they are charging way too much, way too much. So if you want to charge like a super high amount for something, then that's fine. That is your prerogative. You need to go back to who is my market, who wants this and is paying for this, right? And if your market and pricing are off, I know who I want to work with. I want to work with the new entrepreneurs or the newly scaling entrepreneurs. So I know I can't charge $10,000 for my program because new entrepreneurs, well, okay, I'll tell you what, new entrepreneurs get hoodwinked into playing for that, but can they afford it? Usually not. So many of my clients, I have one client who spent $125,000 and I'm sorry, <clears throat> she didn't spend $125,000. She put $125,000 on credit in her first three years of business, hiring people who would teach her how to build, who would get her clients. By the way, it didn't. It didn't. And she's got massive amounts of debt now. Oh, that makes me mad. I have another client I'm working with right now who just spent $18,000 on an eight-month program. Nothing. It's doing nothing for them. Nothing at all. Why? Because it's not teaching them the basics of marketing and sales. It's teaching them the build it and they will come myth. You know what? I'm going to add that to my list. We're going to talk about the build it and they will come with next myth next month. Hang on. Oh, you can see where I get mad. I get real protective of my entrepreneur newbies. Build it and they will come myth next month. What's next with March? March office hours. All right, let's bold that. Let's, let's bold that and let's, uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So, so many people get taught this build and they will come with. And so people are like spending so much money on things they do not need that will not help them. Also, it is in our nature, capitalist conditioning. I don't know. When we have a problem, let's just throw money at it, right? We don't often <laughs> like, what, what, what do I got to do here, right? I don't charge tons because I want to work in a specific market. And so here's what they can on average afford. Because again, I've been doing this over 20 years. I know, I know, right? And so here's on average what is typically reasonable. And I also know that I'm going to be asking you to spend more money. Go buy this platform. Go invest in this YouTube course. Go and take this you know, blog writing course, whatever. So I am not about to sit here and bleed my clients drive every penny they've got because I know I'm going to want them to invest in other things, right? That I'm not the only one that needs to be on their success team, right? So that's me. So I know where to price myself and I know what to offer within that. You need to think about who is my market. And if it's that I want to charge this much, then I, do I need to change my market? Or if my market can only afford this much, do I need to change my offerings or my pricing? right? So your business is like a puzzle. These five things I'm giving you are like a puzzle and all the pieces need to fit. And if a puzzle piece is too big, we got to figure out how to make it the right fit, right? So if you're charging too much, that's the first thing I want you to look at. But the other thing is, am I charging too little? And this is again, really common for new entrepreneurs. A uh, couple of reasons. You're coming from a job where you're getting paid, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks an hour. And so, or a certain salary that works into a certain hourly amount. And so you're thinking, well, I should charge that, right? Or maybe like 10 or $20 an hour more, right? Not realizing that you may make 40 bucks an hour at your job, but 
you know, you're sort of being billed out at, um, you know, $140 an hour by your company because your company has to, your employer has to pay for all the other marketing things and overhead and like all the things, like all the business expenses, right? You're, you're a business expense. They have lots of business expense and they expect a certain return on you. So they're charging more for you per hour, right? Or they're expecting a certain level of performance out of you because you have to earn your keep in order to get paid there, right? So people often come to business with that mindset and they only charge a little bit more than their hourly rate, but you most likely need to be going, what? what would my employer charge for this service, right? I used to work with the, this one marketing agency and I would get graphic design done at $150 an hour. But then I'll meet a new graphic designer who's charging their services out at $50 an hour. I'm like, no, this is what I would pay in a marketing company. You need to raise your rates. Does that make sense? So you have to think beyond what was my hourly rate as an employee. You need to think what is the going rate for this service or this product or this program, okay? The other thing is sometimes people think, well, I'm a new business owner. Yeah, but if you've got 10 years of experience in doing what you do, and you were playing at the same level of people who are charging more for the same experience level, the same quality of work, then you can charge more. So again, it's just really understanding what is the going rate for what it is that I'm selling and am I priced in the right range for that? All right. One caveat to, to this, I will say, I want you to charge a price or a rate or whatever that you feel comfortable with. And I know sometimes people will say like, get out of your comfort zone, charge more. But if you're uncomfortable with how much you're charging, you won't do sales. You won't talk about it. You will clam up. You will trip on your words. You will get nervous and anxious, right? So I want you to charge where you feel comfortable. And then as you go, you can decide if you want to raise it up. Okay. All right. So that's price. Next thing is marketing and messaging. Okay. So if all of that is right, you got the right offering, you know it, you've got the right price, you know it, right? People like you, they're following you, they're buying from you, but not as much as you want. Then we have to look at your marketing and your messaging. How is your copywriting on your website, in your emails, on your social posts, on your sales pages? How is your imagery and your branding? Are you in the right places talking to the right people, whether that's online or in real life? We have to look at where you are not getting yourself out there effectively and saying the right things that make people understand or help people understand what you do and how you help them. So again, what are your customers and clients saying? How are you using those words in your copywriting when you're out there connecting, when you're on a podcast? And then finally, if all of that's working and you're still not making sales, it's your sales flow. There's something wrong in your sales flow. You are making it hard to buy. You are putting a barrier in someplace. Something is confusing or not working or broken. You are not doing the right activities. There is something wrong in the way that you're selling and the sales flow itself that's not working. So you need to go, okay, People get to hear, but then they don't purchase, or I get them this far, or I can't even get them in the funnel, right? you got to look at your sales flow. Remember I said at the beginning of this, your step-by-step, -step, this, and then this, and then this, and then this. If you don't know that, to the extent that it works, <laughs> then you got to figure out where it's broken, okay? So now that you know how not to handle objections, what's next? Hey friends, Editing Lindsay here. And as I said, now that we know how not to handle objections, what's next? First, I want you to go and download my four business building basics every new entrepreneur needs to know. I'm gonna take you through how to understand your clients and your customers, how to market, how to sell, and I'm even gonna show you how to map out a seven day action plan to get to work on the work that matters. Remember to subscribe to my channel, hit the bell so you don't when I post new videos like this video and give me some love in the comments section. Tell me what you took away from today. Tell me if I helped relieve some pressure or made things make sense for you if you're someone who gets a lot of objections. And then next, I've got two more videos for you to watch. They are, of course, my two favorite videos on my consent-based selling process. So you can go watch those next and start to fall in love with my process for selling without selling. Remember friends, consent is sexy, especially in sales. And growing a profitable, scalable business is not that hard when you know what to do. Now get out there and be amazing.